This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. Uh, this is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Mark Moffat, who is a research associate at the Smithsonian Institute, also the author of, most recently, this book, The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive, and Fall. A couple other books out there, including this one, Adventures Among Ants, A Global Safari with a Cast of, <laughs> of Trillions. Uh, welcome, Mark. Well, it's great to be here, Greg, and thanks for smiling when you read my ant book title because the book is supposed to be fun. So, uh, yeah, it is, and, and it has pictures. Right, that makes it easier <laughs> to read, even. But, yeah. um, but look, you know, a lot of times biologists will venture into um, discussions of humans, right? Um, you know, and in your book, you you talk about kind of from a biological perspective, discussing things like psychology and anthropology and philosophy. And you didn't mention sociology and economics, but that's all kind of implied. But it seems like the field of, I don't know, biological imperialists, <laughs> whatever you might want to call them, is dominated by the the the, the chimpophiles, right? You, you mentioned this term kind of chimpocentricity, and, you know, when we're trying to figure out how to understand humans, we, we tend to look to our nearest neighbors, right? We tend to look at chimps, maybe bonobos, and we try to draw inferences from them about kind of what we should expect to see among humans. And yet you talk about how perhaps, at least in some ways, humans are, they more closely resemble the social, the social insects. And, and you know, I guess... You know, E.O. Wilson may have been the original uh, person to kind of make this point, or maybe it was Bernard Mandeville back in, you know, I don't know, the 17th century. But but you, yep. you point out that, that, you know, in many ways we're unlike chimps and that we are in many ways more like these social insects, wasps and ants and so forth. And um, and so, you know, when did you, have you always been kind of, as you, you know, you spent your lifetime studying ants and you've been traveling the world. Uh, of course, as you study ants, you have to encounter humans <laughs> along the way. Yes. Uh, how did these, when these parallels kind of emerge for you, uh, did it come about through your sort of serendipitously or, or have you always been kind of fascinated by the parallels between both humans and, and, uh, social insects? Yeah, well, uh, the parallels are, apparent to us from an early age, and you've forgotten it apparently, but you were originally like me. You were down in your diapers at the age of three months old watching ants. And why were you watching ants? Because the damn cows across the way weren't doing anything. Uh, the ants are busy with all kinds of things that even children recognize. Uh, things like developing highways and infrastructure, division of labor, mm -hmm. things like assembly lines, complex teamwork, agriculture, domesticating things, uh, mass warfare and slavery. These things occur in ants and they don't occur in chimpanzees. And you can argue about terminology, but in fact, I, would, I wrote an article for Skeptics magazine uh, apples and oranges, ants and humans, the misunderstood art of making comparisons. And I pointed out fundamentally mm. that it's really boring to compare things that are identical. It's boring. Mm. The real interest and the real things that move science forward are finding points of comparisons between things that you ordinarily think of as different. And as you indicated there, if chimpanzees behaved exactly like chimpanzees, but were a horse or something, we wouldn't give them any notice because they don't seem to behave very much like the, us. You know, they don't form pair bonds. The females go into heat every once in a while. The males go crazy. They uh, get attacked. They have to hide. All kinds of strange things happen in chimpanzees. But um, in large and societies start to show all this kind of complexity that we recognize. And so, for example, no chimpanzee worries about public health issues. I can tell you, I've been among them. They're not, that's not their thing. Uh, 
But if you're in a large ant society, like a leaflet ant society with several million individuals, you have a health and sanitation squad. You have to deal with the possibility of disease. And a lot of these things emerge, not because we're related to ants, in fact, ants seem to be alien enough to belong to a different planet, but because once you get societies that are big enough, you have to deal with issues like moving resources and labor around. Chimpanzees don't. Well, I mean, both chimpanzees and ants, though, do have these things we, we call societies, really. And, and the book, The Human Swarm, I think is really kind of focused on articulating a, a theory of what we might call a, a society. And, and I guess, you know, when you study animals, you, 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 we talk about groups, we talk about bands, we talk about um, swarms, right? But, but, you know, there's no kind of unified theory, field theory of, of kind of societies. And I think that was sort of what you were, what you were trying to do, right, is, is articulate how animals ultimately, or at least some animals, some subset of animals, actually a minority of animals sort themselves into, you know, us and, and them. And, and I guess, you know, the key difference between if you were to divide the kind of chimps over here and, and the humans and the ants over here is that the, the, the chimps, their version of societies are, are, you know, quite limited, you know, and very, very small. And, you know, whereas humans and, and ants can build these, these gigantic right? Uh, societies, right? That are, that are right. built up of anonymous individuals. Right. And that's, uh, in fact, why that's uh, the points in which I do intersect with sociology in the book, because ironically, sociologists, and in fact, psychologists and biologists too, uh, don't really talk much about societies in the way I mean it. Bounded groups, usually with territories, with a clear sense of us and them, that extends through the generations. You can look at, for example, my mentor was E.O. Wilson, and he wrote a big book called, called Sociobiology, and he barely talks about societies in that fashion. And so what I've done is recognize that there are these bounded groups in certain species and try to figure out where they exist and why they exist and what causes them to stay together and break apart over time. And, uh, you know, for sociologists, many people followed like Benedict Anderson, uh, the idea of imagined communities, the idea that a nation is uh, mm -hmm. an artifact of modern times. It's like the mass media telling us that we're American. But if you look back through history and prehistory, you see that we've always belonged to these bounded groups. And Richard Wrangham, a good friend, talked about this some in his discussion with you that you can stem those groups back through prehistory, right back to uh, the chimpanzee days and find we've always belonged to these groups. They've always been essential to our sense of identity. And it's here that I intersect with psychology and some other disciplines because my mentor, as I said, Ed Wilson had problems. Uh, um, he was attacked for making comparisons between different groups. And uh, I, I think he was almost a little too aggressive about it, the idea that biology can explain things. What I'm finding that's really fascinating to me is that the psychologists know a lot that the biologists can make use to, of. So I'm tr extending myself to the psychologists and others, trying to figure out what I can learn, uh, sort of the two-way street approach, my brain eventually runs out of space, uh, unlike uh, some people's. I seem to have an in infinite capacity, but I'm doing my best at it and finding a lot of fascinating things along the way. And one of them is this distinction you made between a society of a chimpanzee and humans. Well, in economists uh, intersect with biologists in that, you know, we're interested in cooperation, right? And so, you know, we would start from the premise that you know, individuals only really need to kind of get together with other individuals for the purpose of, you know, cooperation. And, you know, where I think biologists have influenced, uh, you know, economists a lot is in thinking in terms of, you know, these tit for tat models, right. Where of, of reciprocity. And then also, you know, we've been thinking at least on the biology side about kind of kin selection 
And I think, you know, you're, you're arguing that this notion of a society is, you know, cooperation theory is not enough to kind of make no. sense of these societies, right? That these societies are really, they, they have to do with identity. You know, they have to do with, with feelings of affiliation and belonging and, and, uh, you know, and conflict. Um, so, I mean, kin selection seems like the most obvious source of group formation. Why, why is, why is that theory kind of in inadequate to explain what's going on here? Well, I'm not a mathematician, but I know that uh, kin selection does not uh, explain human societies. Even the earliest human societies, hunter-gatherer societies, uh, uh, of known history and presumably prehistory consisted of uh, many unrelated individuals, chimpanzee societies as well, uh, bonobo societies, and most uh, animals that have societies that I've been able to work out have societies. The really interesting thing is that they don't have to be kin. You can get along or, or at least form a common identity without just having kin. And frankly, how many people really want to live with their mother and sister? Hunter-gatherers, when they actually looked at the data, spread out among their society's range. So their parents might be way over there. Their sister would be over there. They could visit them sometimes. But personality actually mattered more in some of the information I've seen. There, here's a little band within the society of the funny guys and gals, right? Mm -hmm. So just like today, we organize around uh, friends, not around necessarily relatives. And uh, certain kinds of societies like horse uh, bands, nobody's related. And yet they have this uh, set sense of in-group and they fight off outsiders and so forth. The idea that cooperation is the end all, and where Ed Wilson talked about societies, and he described them as uh, cooperative groups. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, people with that perspective are not looking at the news very much. There's a lot of discord in societies, and there always has been chimpanzee societies have a lot of discord. All these societies have discord. There are things like um, alpha males in a lot of different kinds of societies uh, that push around everybody else and so forth. Uh, there can be murder and other things in quite a few kinds of societies. Uh, the prospect of belonging to this group is an improvement in your uh, likelihood of success and finding mates compared to being off on your own without joining a group. And, uh, but there, there's still the, all that competition going on and the relationships between groups become interesting as well. Do you, are you friends with other groups or not? So that's the difference between species, whether you can be friends with the different groups. So the point is when you're defining societies, you can't do it in terms of what what is called social networks. We have lots of friends that are foreigners, but we still respond to them, as psychologists can show you, as foreign. We still, in our uh, minds, are categorizing them in other groups. That doesn't mean uh, that they're not in our social networks. So social networks exclude a lot of people within societies and, and include those outside societies. And that's true in other, some other animals and many other animals as well. But with some animals like chimps, right, they they presumably can recognize, right, all of the individual members of their of their small group, right? They in other words, you know You've read my book. Yeah, I mean Dunbar, <laughs> you know, we've got the Robin Dunbar, the famous number, right, of one fifty or three hundred, right? There's only so many I don't know, bilateral relationships that you can kind of keep, keep track of, right. Without some kind of system of accounting. Right. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I found uh, fascinating, I've discussed this with a bunch of other folks is that the human brain kind of, you know, got larger and larger and larger and then started to get started to decline. And, you know, some people have said that that kind of reduction was speak for yourself. We, 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 what? Speak for yourself. <laughs> right. No, yeah. I'm so some of this, so I, I some of the people have said that this is because you know it's actually our limbic system that has kind of shrunk because we we no longer needed to be you know fighting all the time. But but I think you're 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 potentially suggesting that 
you know, when we move to a system of, of markers, right. For our social intelligence, then we, you know, we don't, we don't really need to keep track of as many specific, uh, bilateral social, uh, relationships. Right. I mean, it, yeah. is, is it, I mean, is that something like that? Yeah, no, they, uh, You've uh, leapt ahead to a couple of things. So one of them uh, is my realization early on that there are two kinds of ways of forming societies. It's either you know everybody in the society as an individual and think of species like chimpanzees require that and a lot of other mammals require that. Or you have some kind of way of keeping track of who belongs without recognizing individuals, which requires something I've called markers, but you, there are various mm -hmm. words for them, including symbols for humans, more complex markers. Um, and when I, I, I came upon this idea when I realized that ants and humans, despite being virtually alien species to each other, have this commonality. Ants use... Uh, what is equivalent to their national flag, which is a scent on their body surface. And all the ants in the colony have that scent. And as long as you have that scent, you're golden. If you don't, you're attacked, or if you're a colony that's smaller, you run away. Um, humans use a lot more signaling, and uh, that's a big part of social psychology, how this signaling works. Uh, I talk about people as being walking billboards for our identity, because although most of the research has been done on language, we figure out who belongs before they say a word. We figure out it out from all kinds of characteristics. Um, there's even Abigail Marsh uh, down in Georgetown that studied uh, certain kinds of signals that we give to each other. We don't even know we have these signals. Uh, for example, if you uh, are point out someone at a distance to you and ask if they're American, you usually can figure it out by how they walk or wave their hand, even though you don't have any idea you can do that. You usually but you can even right. distinguish them from Australians, apparently. Like that, that to me, I, that, mm -hmm. that blew my mind, right? Yeah. So the point is, and uh, another one that's a favorite is if you show a picture of a person, a picture of a, an Asian person to someone, and they have a neutral expression, you won't be able to say much about them. But if they smile, you usually can tell if you guess correctly if they're American. So smile is smiling is universal, but we do it with our own nuance. So these are characteristics through the obvious characteristics, like how we dress and act, our accents and so forth. But right down to these small characteristics uh, that we don't even uh, learn in any, any obvious way from each other, we're not taught. Um, this is, this ensemble makes it very clear who belongs and who doesn't in our societies, much uh, more, uh, complex than an ant does it with its flag, but just as thorough and hard to, uh, cheat, to pretend you belong when you don't. Well, yeah, this is perhaps the most fascinating part of the book. I, I really enjoyed that part. But before we get to the human part, let's backtrack to uh, the Argentinian uh, ants, because I just recently found out about this before reading your book from a different author about the great Argentine world war, which has been going on for some time. So you got Argentine ants in your kitchen. You're in Berkeley, right? So you've got these yeah. guys, the gals, they're all female, of course, ants are female societies. They're, any ants invading your kitchen are Argentine ants. So they I'll just proceed with the story. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it's the, like if they, if they, if these Argentines, you know, could had literature, right? I'm, I'm sure that you know they would have a Shakespeare <laughs> describing the, the, the Great War in San Diego or you know wherever these kind of battle lines are drawn. Yeah. Well, the identity of the Argentine ant, just like other ants, is set by this national flag. So whether a species of ant has four individuals in it, there are. Uh, species that have just four individuals in their colony or millions, there's a national flag. And the amazing thing about the Argentine ant is how thoroughly it duplicates this uh, symbol across vast areas. Because the Argentine ants invading your kitchen, you can take one of those and drive it down to the Mexican border and drop it off where the 
a customs official are checking everyone's passport and the ants will do just fine. That ant will just merge with the others and go to work because the identity is the same. It's the same colony. But as you indicated, outside of San Diego, there's an area where four colonies, immense colonies converge. And uh, three of them are probably in the billions. This largest colony that extends from where you live down to the Mexican border probably has trillions of individuals. Uh, and when they converge outside of San Diego, they form battle lines that extend for miles. Uh, there is no ambiguity. You take that ant from Berkeley and now carry it the additional inch over that line outside of San Diego and it's torn asunder. So the amazing thing is across all that distance and across all that land, the ants maintain their identity and humans. The really fun dynamic is that our identities change everywhere. We get a Southern culture, we get a Californian culture. Back in hundred other days, societies consisted of a, most of few hundred to a couple of thousand individuals spread over a space. And you didn't know what the other individuals at the other end of your territory were doing. You assumed they were behaving like you, but since there wasn't a lot of communication, they could diverge in the way they said things, the, the rituals they used and other things. And by the time you got together again, they'd start to seem a little bit strange to you. And over time, uh, these hunter-gatherer groups would split. Uh, things became too stressed. And uh, the last step probably was when the half of them gave themselves a new name. That's not a good sign in humans. So now, ants so don't have that problem. They maintain their identity very tightly and they're, they're much more complex about it than you'd think. Uh, this national flag has to change a little bit all the time, depending on what they're eating, can change the scent of them, their bodies. And uh, there can be slight change in genetics. The Argentine ant colony in California is quite varied genetically across that huge space, and yet there's no ambiguity about who belongs. And apparently, as long as you don't uh, have any mutation that changes that national flag, everything else is uh, capable of changing. So genetics can change here and there. As the flag's the same, the society stays uniform. So. If you have a mutation in your scent and you're a queen, and these colonies have many, many queens, you'll be killed instantly. You won't have a chance mm -hmm. to contribute or a way to escape. You're swamped with other ants in this group. They're very dense, so these ants. There can be a million or two individuals in the average backyard in, at Berkeley. But somehow down in Argentina, they managed to kind of create this heterogeneity, right? So. You know, is is the wide footprint of this huge mega, you know, organism in North America? Is this just because it hasn't been that long, and ultimately they will kind of, you know, fragment into you know smaller societies if after a couple centuries in in, in the U.S. I mean, is there perhaps some isolated group will have a mutation, and uh, and then you'll have you know new new tribes of of ants emerge. That would be fascinating. And in fact, some people predict that, but they, these ants have been here for a century and there's no sign of it. And as I say, any mutation is gonna be wiped out instantaneously. So this little group in order to change has to be isolated somewhere and, and then grow big enough to have any chance of success against a trillion individuals. So mm -hmm. I'll go forward first and say that, uh, at a global level, this has led to something extraordinary, even beyond what we've talked about, because the largest of these super colonies, they're called, the one with the trillion or more individuals, controls all the port cities of California. Mm. And it has spread to different parts of the world. So a thousand miles of European coastline, it's not only the same species of ant, but the very same colony Another like the, colony the, sun, is, the sun will never set on this, uh, <laughs> this super colony, right? Well, it's all where you get to first. Another colony has taken over, I believe, Sicily. Different colonies have taken over Australia, uh, Japan. I think the same colony has taken over parts of Hawaii. So you get there first and you blanket the landscape with this aggressive army. And then the next one to come along is never going to make it. So these four colonies that exist in Southern California 
had to be there from virtually the get-go to have a ex- chance to extend their range long enough to, to fight each other in this pro- pro- protracted battle, because it's going on year after year. The battle lines move back and forth several yards every year. Now, let's mm-hmm. go down into the past. In Argentina, the Argentine ant is originally from Argentina and uh, comes from a river basin where the colonies are much smaller, meaning they're a few hundred yards to a kilometer or two wide. Now, if you're the size of an ant, that's huge. So you shouldn't really think of them as something different. What had happened in Argentina is that they evolved there, emerged there, and all these different colonies came about. We can figure out how that happened. That'll be quite something. But it's a mosaic of them. And and now nobody can particularly take over a wide enough space. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a mosaic of many, many different colonies. Presumably the original very large colony from California is still down there in some patches. So the thing is that one, there are two things about this area in Argentina that are extraordinary uh, that, in terms of the ants. And it's because of the, the fact that this is a flooded area. It's always being flooded. And the ants show something that we do uh, called the deer enemy effect. When battles are drawn up, mm-hmm. Over time, the level of aggression tends to drop off and there's a, a subtle border, you know. So during war times, these subtle borders would occasionally have the Germans in the Second World War meeting the Americans and smoking uh, cigarettes together during Christmas. They'd take a little break. So aggression would go way down. This has been seen in chimpanzees and other species too. Mm-hmm. And that's true of ants. But the trouble is down there in Argentina, uh, the river keeps rising and falling, and these borders keep being broken apart, and the ants are forced up on the hillsides or up on trees, and then back down again, and they have to start the battles afresh each time. And uh, they seem to have just lost the deer enemy effect. They just go at it full bore at it and start killing each other. Mm-hmm. And the other thing about this is because the river goes up and down, they have to be very fast at moving homes. So if a boat pulls up to pick up some cargo, the ants are up the gangplank and to America in no time. So they become experts at settling the world. Seems very similar to humans in some ways. Yeah, I want to switch to humans because, um, you know, these human markers of how we kind of distinguish us versus them. I mean, it seems like we have um, we have a, a pretty wide range of tools at our disposal that we can use. And maybe some of them are biological, right? I mean, maybe they're, I think people do talk about, um, you know, appearance and, and, uh, you know, scent as uh, potential markers. You know, I was fascinated by the study that showed that whenever we shake people's hands, we we tend to sniff our fingers, right? I'm not sure if they've figured out exactly what we're we're, we're sniffing for. Yeah. But and and part of that is isn't that part of that is also cultural, right? You mentioned that when these ants will um enslave other ants, they'll they can sometimes get the absorb the, you know, the 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 scent of the of the in, enslaving group or the I mean if it's all genetic that can't be possible, right? Is there something about the 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 diet or do they kind of rub off the the scent? Um you know, in humans people right. will often I think there's a couple there's a couple names for like the the white man that is like the 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 person that smells like butter or you know basically foods that you eat will cause you to you know smell different right I see yeah well uh, things aren't quite as clear for s- smell though certainly this sense of food around the world the smell of food is a very ethnic thing and those are kinds of groups we're talking about as well not just national groups but well bounded ethnic groups at least. Food groups that are well bounded in the way we perceive them and what reality is can be different. But, you know, ants are under recognized for what they're able to accomplish. They can learn, relearn their scent as the scent changes over the time. So, mm-hmm. because of that, these slave making ants can go into other colonies and steal the young, the little larvae, bring them back, and the young emerge as adult ants. And for the first time, they're learning the scent of their colony. They think it's their colony. They have no reason to believe otherwise. And at the same time, the scent on those 
uh, slavery ants is being absorbed by the other ants. And so the full colony will change its mm. identity. Uh, the ants have to track that. Now, in a strange way, we've had a history of doing th similar things ourselves. Enslaved peoples and captured peoples are a big part of early human history. There's a lady named Catherine Cameron studying that with books on captives and so forth. And how those people enslaved and captive people could potentially alter their identity and mm -hmm. become members of the group over time is a big reason that we're capable of having these multi-ethnic societies today. No other species can do this. No other species has this diversity of things going on that we have in modern societies. And those originated through warfare and aggression these kinds of societies. Any society of over a couple thousand individuals, bigger than a small hunter-gatherer uh, foraging group, has a history of warfare and aggression. And luckily, mm -hmm. those uh, peoples from different places can assimilate sufficiently and eventually merge into what can appear to be a single ethnic group. So the Han of China are famously more than 90% of the Chinese population. But if you look closely enough, there are a number of books looking at this. There are all kinds of differences in the identity of Han from place to place. And presumably, a lot of the, this diversity traces back to what were originally many different tribes that became absorbed into one group, to the mutual advantage of everyone in this case. But the, the, the major form of marker that I think you spend time on is this idea of the, like a password, right? Or the, you know, the, the pant hoot among the... The, the chimps, I think you say this is kind of like the, the, the origin or the, the, the mythical origin of the, the whole idea of a, of a password. And, you know, I've been fascinated by how, um, you know, accents can be so different from place to place, not in the United States and these more modern countries. But, you know, even if you go to England or, or France, right, I mean, you, you travel five miles and you'll, you know, you can you can tell that someone is from from a different place, right? And you know, accents are are kind of like a, a a password. And I think that was often used in in history to kind of uncover infiltrators, right? Would you know people would be asked right. to pronounce certain words, and based on their pronunciation, you could tell whether they were kind of us or 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 them, right? So, is is the kind of you know speciation of 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 accents and speciation of of language been sort of one of the primary mechanisms by which identity has been formed among humans? Well, I, I mentioned, you mentioned passwords, so I'll start there. But the question is how all this began for humans, because chimpanzees don't have any of these kinds of signals. They uh, have to know each other as individuals. They have a pant hoot, though, that may differ from one group to the next. And that might be a hint of how something could have gotten started in humans. So uh, the idea of a password is, hey, I belong, just shout that in some way. Uh, some right, like if you think signal. about in the trenches, right? So the guy's coming back from the, you know, no man's land to, to the trenches in, in, you know, warfare, and they've, they've got a little password that they learned, right? Right, and it doesn't even have to be language. Uh, I played uh, uh, basketball when I was a kid on the street, and we didn't have jerseys, but we knew everybody. On the other hand, if we both, if we all had red jerseys, we wouldn't have to glance over our shoulder to see if that, confirm that that was John before we passed to him. We could do it instantaneously. So even in small societies like hunter gatherers originally had, there was a potential advantage to having certain kinds of signals to indicate that you belong. In a way, you're actually, because these signals are actually potentially processed much like we process different animal species. So that's mm -hmm. an elephant because of those trunks and uh, giant ears and tusks and so forth. Uh, this tribe, we dress this way, this tribe speaks this way and so forth. We're keeping track of these things. We're basically displaying by giving the right password, the fact that we are human, that we're, we belong to that species in our heads. Now, it was a great scene. Uh, yeah. 
there was a part of the narration I may not have clicked back to, but we can go anywhere you want. Well, I just remember during, I think it was the, um, it was one of the playoff games, uh, the NBA this past season where uh, Steph Curry passed to a rival on the bench. <laughs> and, and it's because the guy was wearing a, a white t-shirt when the Warriors were wearing white shirts and the rival team was wearing uh, a dark shirt. And after he passed the ball to the guy on the bench, the guy stood up and he, and he, he pointed to his, his shirt as the reason for the pass, right? Cause it was one of these no look passes. And I thought of that when, you know, you, you yep. talked about kind of, you know, Jersey colors and, and uniforms and, and how important it is that, you know, people would distinguish themselves on, on the battlefield or elsewhere. But yeah, through, that, that password's dress. a bit, the password's a bit too simple. That's what you're saying. And so it would make sense for that password to evolve into a suite of characters that triply confirmed mm -hmm. who that person was. And the fact that we can tell who's an American almost always from the distance suggests that, you know, a hunter gatherer seeing people coming from across that, you know, vast Serengeti could still be comforted to know that whoever they are, we can't tell quite yet, they're us. We don't have to worry mm -hmm. about it. So that kind of signaling is very low cost. And to get back to something you talked about earlier, uh, individual identity, the sort of things where you keep track of everybody as individuals can be quite expensive. So what that does for us is it frees up our brain. Having these signals, uh, we can be in a, I talk about a Starbucks surrounded by people we've never met before and not be particularly concerned for a second because we are processing the individuals around us at a very high speed, faster than the blink of an eye. And and spend all our energy, time, and mental effort with that friend across from us. And that mental effort has to be distributed over, at most, uh, Dunbar says 150 individuals. If I told you it was 500, you'd just think of a different group of friends for which that would apply. So I'm not sure it's really 150, but the point is that uh, you can save a lot of mental effort in societies uh, by having allowing for strangers. And that's what we did. Chimpanzees and most species don't allow for strangers. Mm -hmm. And allowing for strangers was a big step in our evolution, even though it happened back in a point of time where our societies were quite small by modern standards. That was essential when the opportunity came along for societies to grow. It had to be there already because you can add individuals to society at no cost. As long as they do the right things, behave the right way and so forth, we could be comfortable with societies, societies that can grow to any size. And that's very unique to humans and a few ants. The Argentine ant has no limits on its colony size. As long as there's resources and space that giant colony can keep growing. It's being stopped by some other colonies now. And as long as there's resources in space, China can keep growing. So kind of a politically charged statement to make today, but uh, with uh, things going on in Taiwan at the moment. But as long as there's resources in space, certain species of ants and humans are essentially the only organisms that it can allow societies to keep growing and growing and growing. I mean, it, it is remarkable that humans can create these huge societies like the Roman Empire or the, the United States. But but you 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 posit you, you make a claim, um, you hypothesize that the proliferation of these markers, right, these distinguishing markers is 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 a function of kind of, you know, the degree of conflict or encounters that you have. And I, I guess, you know, I don't know whether there's a cause and where the cause and where the effect is, but but um you know, you spend a substantial portion of the book talking about things like hairstyles and, you know, tattoos um, and, uh, and you know, who would have thought that different hairstyles would make such a huge difference? But I guess among Native Americans, right, you know, you look out across the plains and you see someone coming at you with a different hairstyle and you know, you know, that, that could be trouble. Um, I was driving around just yesterday and uh, in, in Marin and I saw somebody in a pickup truck get pulled over by a, a cop and I, I looked in the door and the driver had a had facial tattoos right and so I, I i you know when you're in prison you get these facial tattoos or you're part of a gang and it's sort of a 
it's it's an irreversible commitment, right? I mean, it's an it's an irreversible marker that is pretty difficult to shed. And and you mentioned a couple of stories about how when uh, there were some Europeans who were abducted by the Comanches or by other Indian groups and were kind of tattooed and they they never wanted they didn't want to go back, right? Because they were um, irreparably kind of marked out as being members of this of this of this group so tattoos are reverse hairstyles perhaps are more reversible yes but you know with accents if you don't if you don't learn the language as as a youth you know it, it's almost impossible for you to be you know fully part of the the culture that you're attempting to join right yeah well they yeah getting good you got back to accents that's what i was trying to remember earlier uh the link uh, to that part of the conversation because you know the the thing about accents uh they demonstrate how diverse a society can be hmm. societies don't have to have an identical national flag in every trait we can have a southern accent and we can have uh, all kinds of diversity and cuisines and so forth in the united states the difference now from hunter gatherers uh, times is that uh there's social connections everywhere. We're learning about each other and we can decide that, oh, okay, the people down there are American and they're doing it that way and we're comfortable with that. There may be a mm -hmm. point where we behave with a, oh, we don't see them as comfortable to us anymore and that's trouble. But as long as we're comfortable with it, we can have many different accents. So in fact, languages aren't necessarily always the best predictor of a society border. Uh, they are in many mm -hmm. cases, you know, the Aborig Aborigines of Australia had many different languages. People would know the adjacent people's language. Yeah, but I bet they didn't quite pronounce it right, right? So they still could be detected. Uh, but there could be two recently formed groups that split apart that essentially speak the same language. But certainly mm -hmm. language is a very fast predictor of who belongs. You don't have to see them. You can hear them around the corner and react. So mm -hmm. approach slowly when you uh, uh, do your attack of the in, uh, neighboring village. That's what, and quietly. Yeah, but it, it's incredible how plastic the different kind of markers can be, right? I mean, you know, you talk about how you can, I mean, this is, I think, well known in, in the psychology literature where, you, you know, you take a group of people and you just throw some, you know, red jerseys on one group and some blue jerseys on the other group and all of a sudden, you know, the members of the red jersey group think that their colleagues are superior in some way, right? Um, so, I mean, it, it, how how easy is it for humans to kind of create new societies? I, I thought that, you know, once we get to the humans, that even the definition of a society becomes a little bit hard to pin down, right? Because, you know, in, in the book, you, you will you'll sometimes go from discussing societies at the kind of national level. And then you'll talk about these sort of, you know, subgroups and, you know, we as humans, we feel like we belong to, I guess, you know, multiple overlapping societies. And then these societies can, can, you know, fission at any point in time. Right. So, I mean, you, you mentioned, for instance, in, in Rwanda where the Hutus and the Tutsis went from being, you know, one society to, to two societies. Right. Um, yeah. How, how, I mean, how, humans are, and that, that makes humans unique. I mean, I don't think that the ants would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in this society or that society. And, and you discuss the, 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 the famous right. split that happened in, 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 uh, in Gombe, right. Where the one society kind of became, became two societies. Well, there's an, a number of things to disentangle there. Uh, uh, humans have many forms of identity within societies and between societies. I would argue that we've always had a primary society. That's the group other than our original immediate families for which we feel an allegiance and are willing to fight for and even die for. There are certain kinds of groups that kind of uh, steal some of those properties, like the mafia or gangs or so forth. There's an expectation of a great commitment, whether your grandkids are expected to be part of those gangs, I'm not quite sure. But with societies, your grandkids are expected to be part of those societies. Within those and between those societies, you have all kinds of other affiliations. And we move between those affiliations every moment of the day. 
but those are secondary in my mind to societies, particularly in terms of their origin. Now, hunter-gatherers did not have these kinds of groups. There were no knitting clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, these kinds of groups emerged in abundance as societies grew bigger and bigger. And uh, Mary, Marilyn Brewer talks about optimal distinctiveness theory. And that's the idea that as groups get bigger, you feel lost in the group and you have to develop more ways of identifying with other groups to feel like a unique and singular human being. So societies grew, hunter-gatherers, uh, including settled ones, those that did not move around freely, like the ones we've been talking about, moved around f freely, but there certain societies settled down. And then uh, societies with agriculture and so forth started to develop more and more kinds of groups. Uh, I argue indeed to, to, for people to feel comfortable with their themselves as unique individuals as societies got too big for them to manage as a sole identity. So I would say, and that's in fact my hypothesis, that uh, the society itself called the community and the chimpanzees was the original form that these groups took. And all these other groups are secondary. And the potential for us forming these groups now is immense. So, you know, if you're on a tour bus for the day, and you share some bonding experiences, you can feel like a group for the day. If you're told that uh, you like the number three and those other people over there like the number four, and you're, you'll, you should hang around with people who like number three, even though you know that's absurd, you will tend to prefer the ones you're told like number three, uh, the number three. So it's really amazing how much mental processing is going on for groups in general. And this is much of modern psychology. My current interest and major interest is drawing people's attention to this, what I see as this primary affiliation, this most ancient affiliation. But you also say that in order for you to feel that sense of belonging, that there has to be another, right? There has to be some, and, you know, I think Charles Tilly, you know, made this point, you know, even uh, I think, you know, you, you, you quote, oh, is it Heraclitus <laughs> said this, right? I mean, if you, if you don't have some kind of conflict or, or war, then the, the sense of, of belonging kind of, kind of withers or dilutes. I mean, is, it, is this idea of kind of a universal society where we all belong to this cosmopolitan thing called humanity? I mean, is that, is that unrealistic? I mean, from a biological, psychological perspective? I mean, is, is cosmopolitanism antithetical to, to how we, how we operate as humans, as, as organisms? Well, I'll I mean, if, off, if, if, uh, for instance, if the ants, if those, if that gigantic group of Argentine ants were to exterminate all of the other bands and it, that, that would just be one huge, you know, species. What is there something reason yes, why humans there would be do that? one of the most aggressive species on the face of the earth, because the battles occurring in California, millions of ants are dying every week. If that single colony won, it would look like the most beneficent wonder species of all time. In fact, it originally was. Originally, no one knew about these battles going on near San Diego and just saw this vast sea of friendly ants, couldn't figure it out. So it is quite something for the ants. Um, yes, well, the... And I, and I will back up and say one thing you uh, mentioned is a little bit off. We do not have to have conflict with other groups. We do not need to battle other groups. Over time, those that battled other groups and engulfed them and assimilated them became the big nations of today. But this is not a requirement for the human species. Uh, In-group uh, love is a much stronger thing than out-group hate. So in the right conditions, we can still prefer our own group without making an abomination of others. Uh, the trouble is in times of stress, it's easy to turn to others as a source of blame. And we see that all the time now in periods, you know, it seems like we're in the middle of a time of stress for a lot of people and the immigrants get blamed and so forth. But the question of whether we need more than one society, I talk about a number of examples in the book. 
Uh, my favorite is Futuna, which is uh, off in uh, the Polynesia area. It's a little island that ha had space for exactly two chiefdoms. And chiefdoms are a form of society that's pretty aggressive. They're, they constantly are fighting other chiefdoms. In fact, they're the first step towards the emergence of many nations with some kind of chief that took over adjacent groups and that kept expanding. Hawaii had huge chiefdoms, but this island was so small, it just had room for two chiefdoms. But for some reason, decade after decade after decade after decade, there were always two chiefdoms. One never beat the other one. And I argue in the book, well, maybe they needed the other one. Maybe, maybe they needed a source of contrast. Well, this, in this is case, in, in, uh, in Daniel Defoe, right? The, 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 big, the big egg and the little egg people, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, <laughs> yes. Well, so yeah. So is that true? In this case, they're aggressively connecting with each other. They don't, as I argue, they don't necessarily need to, but as chiefdoms, they were fighting all the time. They had a big celebration day once a year, but that was about it. Uh, and I would say that we require societies and those societies nowadays include ethnic groups within societies, which act again as bounded groups within our societies. Those emerged since hunter-gatherers days. And they, indeed, I talk about them as being societies within societies. We need those. They aren't negative in themselves. They're a great well, part I mean, of we, our we identity. Could, we presumably could displace, I mean, the, the, the need for others could be converted into something a little more peaceful, like, you know, football rivalries and, you know, Olympics well, and Well, I'm and saying so that forth. we don't, we don't need rivalry between the groups. We can celebrate the Mexican-American heritage, food, and so forth. Uh, we and we need those to feel um, to feel complete. Well, you, but you could, I mean, and validation. Could, well, presumably, I mean, you, those 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 schisms could be rearranged, right? So rather than say, I don't know, Mexican Americans versus Anglo Americans, you could have you know, Dodgers versus Giants, right? I mean, it could be local, right? Uh, type well, you're putting, rivalries you're or... putting things in terms of rivalries, but I'm saying they don't have to be rivalries. They can just be a joyous part of the diversity of our society. That's what mm -hmm. we need to drop. We're not going to be able to, no one is going to want to drop such an extensive part of their identity as their, their this heritage, this long heritage of traditions and so forth. This does not go away readily. You can't replace them with a simple thing like a football team. However, you can get cross-cutting ties across different peoples. If you get a diversity of these people at a football game, all cheering for the same team, this is one of the strongest ways of reducing any uh, diff negative differences between groups. The big challenge to remove is not to make these groups disappear because no one wants to want the, that. They give us meaning and validation in our lives. It's to make the negatives about them, reduce those as much as possible. And that's a real trick. I'll leave that to you. Maybe uh, someone in the economics field can do it, but I'm not sure my way, the way forward there. But uh, well, yeah, I mean, are there, are there dis are economies of scale at, at some level, right? I mean, the... The American societies, Chinese society, these are these are fairly fairly large societies. I mean, you talk about how in 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 chimpanzee society, right? There's going to be a size that once that size is exceeded, there tends to be some fragmentation. There tends to be some some budding, right? Uh, have is there is there any evidence that humans have some maximum kind of group size beyond which it becomes difficult for individuals to to feel a, a sense of of belonging or identity have we, we well have we... yeah the uh chimpanzees of course as they say have individual recognition they n require knowing each other and among other social stresses the mere fact that once you get a group of well over a hundred People are, they, chimpanzees, sorry, I think of them as people some days, uh, <laughs> uh, don't actually may not know each other as well. They may be uncomfortable just not recognizing others. So that puts a cap on the societies uh, that have that necessity. And as I said before, 
theoretically at least, we don't have that cap. As long we can keep adding more individuals as long as they behave uh, as we expect. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not out there counting. Uh, uh, how many Amer Americans are there now? 400, 500, I don't, I'm not even sure, 400,000, let's say, individuals. We're not out there aware of the fact that there are 400,000 individuals. It's all, our minds cannot handle that. So whether it was colonial days with a few tens of thousands or today, people might well be in the same cognitive space. So uh, in, that, in that case, we can grow societies as big as we want, whether these, those can include enough variation from place to place because mm -hmm. societies do vary and as i say we adjust we get information around about each other and accept that people in california are strange particularly in cal and berkeley you know have all these strange <laughs> eccentricities and so forth we adjust to that but at what point that breaks is certainly a question maybe we are at the point of breakdown here. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, reason for us to be concerned. Um, society- it does, it does seem it, like whenever there's a 9-11 or, or some, you know, some kind of threat to the national uh, security, that the, you know, the, the divisions tend to get suppressed, right? So, you know, you, you look, at, look at some of the, the wars that, you know, we, we engage in, right? It's like it, many of them don't seem to serve much purpose, but they, you know, do they have a, have a, maybe some unifying uh, element to them, some upside yeah, that could a, be in the form of, of. That's wars can be a big positive. That's been said by folks from the, throughout the history of sociology. And, um, um, 9-11 particularly struck us because it did hit symbols of our society. You know, the World mm -hmm. Trade Center and the Pentagon were symbols of our society. That made them, if they had hit an equally populous area with, that wasn't so ingrained in our heads, it would not have been as traumatic. So that's interesting mm -hmm. as well. The thing is, though, the close studies show that during times of war, that could be unifying for most of us, including the dominant people, but there are often minorities who are associated with the war situation and all kinds of schisms and stresses emerge. Mm -hmm. And as well with 9-11, most of uh, this unity you talk about came about uh, among the Caucasian population because Frankly, if you look at, if you uh, surveyed some of the minority groups, a lot of them view the symbols of the nation and the power of the nation and the wealth of the nation, they associate it with white people. So it was actually much less unifying for them. So we have to get around these kinds of complexities. So if you ask any American to picture an American in their head, just essentially all of them think of a white guy. That's the first thing. So that's why Chinese American people are constantly being asked where they're from. And that affects their connections with the rest of us. They may be totally patriotic, but they also feel a bit like outsiders. And that's why I talk about ethnic groups as societies within societies. They're reflecting their own kind of identity and they have to use a lot of their mental effort to do so. Uh, if you're a white male in this country, you can spend a lot of your mental effort being an individual. If you're an ethnic group member, you have to be both Mexican and American. And believe it or not, that takes some mental effort. So these are certainly well, is that, complexities. Is that necessarily I mean, that doesn't seem necessarily true, right? I mean, there, there have been numerous examples where the paradigmatic individual in a society is, is from, a, from a minority. I mean, presumably a dominant majority, minority in some, some right. way, right? So, you know, when you're forging these markers of, of, of a society, I mean, they could presumably override things that might be more salient, right? So you can change the salience. Yes. To some degree yes right? you can you can and there there are different ways of doing it i'm just saying that the 
a large, uh, there's all sorts of things going on in terms of identity with war and other things that the unity that we feel yeah. is never, probably never universal. And in fact, can be harmful for some people. Um, a, a famous case of the minority, even a, a mistreated minority being given this high status as the Ma Maori of New Zealand, where they have a very high status. That's the best example I know. Well, you also talk about what, what is called in-group over-exclusion, right? And there's this story, which I'd never heard before, of these German refugees from, from Hamburg that um, I guess they, they got on the wrong train and wound up in a death camp and were exterminated. That, that, was, a, that was a remarkable story. I'd never, never heard that one before. But I guess the, the, the question is, you know, we look at situations like Bosnia where a community that had identified in one way shifted almost overnight to very different sources of identity and different definitions of society. And, you know, this civil war was, was, uh, was launched you know, what, how, how, is there a way we can predict those sorts of things? I mean, how do you, can you identify the, the underlying, which, which underlying schism markers are, are likely to emerge within these societies? Well, in the original hunter gatherer societies, I spoke a little bit about how that happened because there, those societies would be very hom hom homogeneous compared to societies of today. So there would be minor differences from place to place, but those differences would matter a lot, nevertheless, to the people there. But those differences would actually change over time because of the poor communications back then. And eventually, uh, the society would divide, break in half permanently. And that seemed to happen once every few centuries and what little information we can gather. Oddly enough, uh, according to George Mar Joyce Marcus at the University of Michigan, nations don't seem to last any longer, a few centuries at most. Mm -hmm. So we're middle-aged in the United States. And we're seeing some of the creakiness, perhaps. So why, with all those controls we have in nations today, with that government in infrastructure and communications and so forth, do societies break apart? <coughs> well, excuse me. Well, um, when you do look at the way societies break apart, some of them are uh, artificial, like North and South Korea. But when they do break apart uh, through uh, civil war, uh, it's nowadays not this random thing that looks random that hunter-gatherers had that lived in these little moving hunter-gatherer bands. It's not the random kind of thing you see, saw then. It's along ancient cultural lines. So countries like Yugoslavia uh, were cobbled together with people that did not share a lot of things, very few things. And to break apart uh, gives you a lot of advantages. So something like Bosnia suddenly can return to their national language and flag and uh, cultural this and that, and people can be quite happy about it. Uh, even though usually when these nations break apart, and that includes, you know, looking at uh, the Maya and others, China, the smaller nations that are, arise from it, from, from the ashes, are usually much less wealthy. They don't have the, the resources this big Goliath originally had. So they're going through stress, and yet they feel this greater commonality. So breaking apart tends to occur in, in places you predict based on the history of how those societies were brought together, which is usually through aggression. But sometimes it's these trivial differences that then kind of, you know, people fixate on, right? And become, you know, markers of, of enmity, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we can fixate on anything. Anything could be an excuse and a pivot point. So that's certainly true. You know, like if you think about some of the, the, the religious <laughs> divisions that seem, uh, you, know, you know, built on, on minutiae of, of theo theology. Right? It's, um, it's amazing how we sort out what's important or not. And so it, it seems mm -hmm. to change year to year. 
you know? So we, we could talk about any number of current things, but I don't particularly want to go there. But nevertheless, all kinds of things happen that suddenly become uh, excuses as a way to, uh, to uh, really address underlying issues of people not belonging for more substantial reasons. Well, you, you mentioned before the podcast that you, you feel smartest right after you write a book. So, so now it's, it's, it's been two years since you finished this book. <laughs> um, do, do you feel less smart now or do you uh, feel a whole lot smarter? What have you been doing since you, you've written this book? Oh, well, you know, I've been uh, at home. You may not believe this, but there's not a lot of call for entomologists during a COVID epidemic. And I am trained as an ant biologist. So I was pretty useless. I made coffee for my wife who works in the medical industry. So she was the essential person. And I was this unnecessary guy with a PhD. But I am now working on walking back a bit to look more at the societies across different animals. My previous book, The Human Swarm, had a lot about animals in it. The book's title emphasized the fact that I addressed issues around humans and psychology and anthropology and so forth. But I really need to back up and look at some of the diversity of societies, which include an oddball lizard in Australia, uh, a bird uh, here and there, a couple of fish I'm gonna look at, so I'm back to my old ways, which is basically as an escape artist. So, Greg, if you need to get out of Dodge, let me know where you want to go. We'll find a critter and we'll track it down. <laughs> well, I remember when I used to go to the Animal Behavior Society meetings, they, they would ask me what animal I studied. And I said, humans. And they said, you're, you're at the wrong conference. But, but I think, Mark, you, you would fit in at any one of these conferences. Uh, human non-human primate ants whatever human swarm <laughs> glad Check it to out. hear it's that great book yeah <laughs> thanks greg also <laughs> ventures among ants check this one out too out of print but great still available chatting. thanks <laughs> so great chatting with you mark hopefully we'll chat again soon this is unsilo brought to you by alumni fm connecting people through stories 